Maybe I've forgotten the name and the address of everyone I've ever known. It's nothing I regret. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's Tuesday evening. I'm Kevin Graham. He's Russell Boyce. And we are now floating in Screamer Celica. Russell, do you think there's a bit of a new order there? Uh, regret. I like that. Do you think, will we be regretting signing Joe Hart and James McCarthy? Well, I think we had to... We had to bring it up today because it's a huge day when Celtic sign two players on the same day and it's not the 31st of January, Kev, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> for a Correct. start. Correct. Um, I think we will live to look at these both decisions and I'm hopeful we've got both right this time. And I've, I've said quite a few times, I think short-termism has to be looked at whilst you can have a long-term vision for where your team wants to go. You always need to deal in the here and now. And I'm convinced that both these players have been designed, are signed in the design of, you know, short-term gain um, because they can, they're two players that are, they're straight out the wrapper into the team, aren't they? Let's be honest. Definitely. And it's, as you say, it's bizarre for us to sign guys that we've actually heard of from clubs that we've actually heard of <laughs> um, now, now, nowadays. And they're, 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 they're weighty signings. For me, they're weighty signings. And they're up there with two of the biggest names to appear in Scottish football, at least over the last five years. For us, anyways, probably since Scott Sinclair, uh, with terms of the weight of experience, the kudos that the two names bring. To the to the Scottish game to Celtic, and and it's like it feels like we've been trying to sign James McCarthy since two thousand and twelve, right enough, and that's us just man- <laughs> uh, that that's us just managed to get it over the line. But Joe Hart, uh, I mean, the last time I saw Joe Hart in the flesh, Lee Griffiths was putting two free kicks past him at Hamden, uh, so. What, what I like about both deals, both deals are long-term deals. One's three years and one four, one's four years. Yep. Uh, it shows that both guys are absolutely committed to the project, to the club. And I just think it's a decent bit of business. On paper, it's a decent bit of business. Uh, obviously, we don't know how it's going to turn out. But, hey, we've seen guys with a bit of pedigree. And Real pedigree. And what we're, what we're actually going to need to admit, and we will admit this, and I'll admit this, no problem whatsoever, is the reason that they're here is because they are slightly damaged goods. That's the reason that that's the reason that they've rocked up at Celtic Park, and I'm, I'm not. That's that's fair enough with me. That is fair enough with me. I know their level. I know the level of Scottish football, but what I'm quite pleased what I'm quite pleased about is yeah. Both guys have showed a bit of commitment to come to, to come to Celtic. Joe Hart has took what will be a massive wage cut to come to Celtic if the reported wages are true. And I was going to call him Mick McCarthy there. James McCarthy. <laughs> James McCarthy. Um, I probably will have also uh-huh. had if if the if the rumours are true, James McCarthy has probably turned down better basic wages to come to Celtic also, to come to his boyhood club. What do you think of that, Russell? I think you're spot on and, and you know something. There's nothing wrong sometimes with going for guys that are, as you might say, damaged goods. I think too often we've went for the potential project and when they come off we can all sit and gloat and go, look at the profit on that. Look at the, look what they achieved and look at the profit. But for every one of them, like we've said before, there has been another one that's been an absolute dud and hasn't helped the cause at all. And I just feel that... But I've said this, honestly, we are in a war this year, you know, to try and win that title back. We need people that are going to be able to hit the ground running and that get what this crazy world we operate in Scottish football is and it is bonkers and I'm not saying oh god how could you patronise people and say they all need to adapt to Scottish football which is a backwater or whatever 
Scottish football, to me, as its mad own, you know, entity, <laughs> it doesn't even operate. I know it gets coefficient points, but really, it's it's got its own point system that's completely different to anything else you see in any other league. And I just feel with Joe Hart coming in for a player in the slide who may well his best shot stopping days perhaps are behind him. And I've seen more analytics today, which it was a bugbear of mine at times because. But the, what they're saying is he was in the bottom 3%, I think I read today, for a, a shots, long shot saved or expected shot saved or something like that in Europe from his 10 games last year. The flip side is what you'll never get a stat for is the amount of times a headed ball is being cleared by a defender because Joe Hart told him where to go. And that is going to happen. Well, Joe Hart will talk for 90 minutes those players through the game. That's the difference. Is he as good as what he used to be? Obviously not. Otherwise, we don't get him. But could we resurrect him? I don't know. If he gets the bit between his teeth and for the first time in a long time feels the number one at a club on a long-term deal, which he's not had since Man City because he went to Torino and was first choice, but it was on loan. Mm -hmm. I think you could get something. James McCarthy's coming here to prove every single person, what, firstly, what they missed and that I told you I wanted to sign for you the whole time. That is what he's going to come and he, because he's such a big Celtic fan, he's got a title to try and win back. And I think you'll watch him in, in, as a, in an inspired role this season as well. And there's nothing, there's nothing that strikes me with James McCarthy to say he could not be that replacement for Scott Brown that we have been crying out for. Maybe not just since the summer, by the way. Maybe a wee bit longer than that. But at 30 years old, he can come in and be that huge influence in the team. And I know Bit of Dig sounds a bit lazy. I get all that these days. That's not terms people like. But one thing he also is very good at is on when you get when he gets the ball, he's <laughs> extremely effective as well. I would expect both players um, to become mainstays of the team going forward. I think both bring weight of experience and character. I think you're right what you say is about Joe Hart. Joe Hart brings a presence that Unfortunately for us, Barkas and Scott Bain, and unfortunately for them, haven't shown uh, over the last 18 months since Fraser Foster left. So I think both guys have got an opportunity here to resurrect, as you say, I am the resurrection and I am the light to resurrect their career. Steve MC10 says, well chuffed with our business today. That seems to be the general opinion, Steve. Everybody seems to be like... Quite happy with it anyway. Yeah. The, major, the majority, the majority of, of fans seem happy with it. Uh, Drew Drew Mac FC loving the irrationals. I think that he means me and you, Russell. We are the irrationals, and because Drew actually called the panel today on the bulletin, the rationals. So we are the irrationals. Irrationals. Well, I like. I want to be irrational. That's just I'm that's just that like character just out of the ground, Drew. Thank I'm you, happy. mate. I'm happy with that. Uh, Michael the boy, Craig Gordon rescued his career at Celtic, so no reason why Hart can't and McCarthy can't either. I, I completely agree with that as well. Uh, we are, we are, we are, we're not taking a... We are, you take a chance signing any player. Agreed. But, but, but it's true. Nobody expected Craig Gordon to go on and achieve what he achieved when we signed him from Celtic. It's uh, nice to have a couple of thoroughbreds in though, do you know what I mean? That mm -hmm. are distinguished careers already behind them but still I mean 34 for a goalkeeper is no age at all these days no, no, absolutely no. nothing and no, 30 no. years old for a midfielder who's I know what Michael said injury prone there but also when he's fit he knows how to get to a fitness level of EPL standards for over a decade now or around a decade he's been operating at that level you know you look at the clubs and you Wigan Everton Crystal Palace, has he ever been relegated? I don't think so. So I don't think so. No, because I think he went to Everton for about 13 million at one point. Facebook user comes in, he kind of backs up what we're saying, Russell. 75 caps for England. Yes, he's not had a great few seasons, granted, but he's a massive addition to the current squad. And in my opinion, puts a bit of confidence back in the Celtic team, knowing that yeah. cal calibre of player is in the sticks. Again, you look at it, Kev. You look at Welsh and you look at Murray, and we're all for it. We've advocated on this show and on, on Axon loads of times. It's brilliant to see young Celtic players getting a chance, Kevin. 
brilliant to see. But what chance have you got when the goalie's silent behind you and he puts the fear of God up you any time the ball crosses the halfway line? Well, that, that was one thing Anne says at the, before the Mitchell line game last week, Russell. He says that um, he put in Bain because he needed his he needed his voice, he needed his presence, he, he could talk to the back four. And I went, well, that just shows you that Barkas doesn't communicate. And that was the only reason Bain seemed to get the nod uh, over him. And does that explain why Bain got the nod over him last year as well eventually? Because Bain was more a communicator. More than, of a communicator. Than, than, than Barkas, eh? So we just need to wait and see if what's going to happen. But you were, you were talking about further breads there. And we're, go- and we're going back to the 30th of July 2000. But first, 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 I need to bring up your tracksuit top. Yes, mate. Try to yes, get it right in the right angle. Look at that. The That's vibe, the clue to the show. The, the vibe I'm getting is cool runnings. <laughs> one, one, one of the greatest films ever made. That is the vibe that I'm getting. Nice one, Jamaica's never had a bobsleigh team. Well, they have now, and Russell's got the track it up to absolutely prove it. Aye, so we're back to the 30th of July 2000. And this is, this is an area where we like to go back to because it's a happy time. It's a happy place. It's when you go to the meditation and they go, thank you, you're a happy place. It's a comfort ha- blanket, isn't it? It's a comfort blanket to, uh, a comfort blanket to go here. It's the first game of the 2000-2001 the season and it's mm-hmm. Matt O'Neill's first domestic game in charge. And we're going to Tanadice. And what, one of the things that I had forgot about this season and when I started researching this was this was the first season that the Premier League, or the Premiership as it's now called, uh, had went to 12 teams. And Aberdeen had been saved from relegation the previous season when they finished mm-hmm. bottom of the ten team league. And it was just weird reading it was just it was weird reading that again. I forgot about that. I think that was the second time that Aberdeen survived relegation because of of league reconstruction. It's quite it's quite mad to feel uh, to think of Aberdeen. Obviously they were terrible round about that point. But the fact is, like, they should have got relegated that season and didn't they? It's still a bit of a stomach punch for a guy who would, like me who grew up in the 80s. Well, the fact is as well, I mean, you look at Aberdeen then, it's a lot closer to them when they won the, the Cup Winners' Cup than what it is if Aberdeen were chronic, you know, even five, six years ago, which they've not been. Mm-hmm. It's quite funny to think they, they dropped so low, not relatively that long after... They were one of the kings of Europe by winning one of the, the big trophies. It is interesting that Dundee United to be playing um, finish 11th, 11th this season, but I don't know how with Alan Cumming goes. Uh-huh. The best goal performance I've ever seen in my life. Uh-huh, it, was, it, was a, it was a great performance oh. by Alan Cumming this day. Facebook user comes in, Falkirk were messed over again, Partick via AFC and a nick. I think what you actually means there, Aberdeen survived because Falkirk didn't have a stadium and they couldn't, they couldn't the ground share with somebody. I think that's what happened. It was, it was um, you had to have a minimum this is when the SPL brand they were trying to promote was, but they just got all the fundamentals wrong, Kev. Mm-hmm. They made it a minimum requirement to have a 12,000 seater stadium to become an SPL club. Thus, turning it... Oh, it's Suey, yes. It's Suey, aye. Um, thus, turning it into an exclusive members club for 12 out of your top 16 teams, really. And if you're mm-hmm. out with the top 16, you've got no chance of being in the league. Whereas most progressive countries, Kev, want you to be promoting... You need to have X amount of under-21s or uh, players that have came through your squad in there. And use your money on your academy. You need, to have a, you need to have a proper academy to get in the league. We want to do it on stadium numbers that, let's be honest, half the league people that are in there don't get anyway. So what a strange, backwards, stupid movement that was. And I'm not sure if it still exists in the SPL. It's not in place anymore because Inverness came up, eh? Inverness. It got dropped, though. It got I'm, dropped at one point to 8,000, I'm sure. Inverness, the club that the basically the Scottish League created, 
uh, if you ever go back and read the story of Inverness, Caledonia and Thistle, then basically they were, like, I'm, I'm not beating about the bush here, the, the owners were basically bribed by the Scottish League and told, merge their two clubs, you're going to get into the Scottish League. So merge Inverness, I can't even remember the two teams' names, Inverness Thistle and in- Inverness Caledonia, funnily enough, uh, merge their two teams and you're guaranteed to get a place in the Scottish League. No, that's that's the that that was the the what happened. There, there was basically bribery going on and stuff yeah. like that. It's a, it's a horrible situation. But then, Falkirk Stadium, uh, Falkirk Stadium's in the Grange with blast zone. That's how they haven't they got a stand on one side. That's true. <laughs> so that'll is, never change. That'll never change. They can't get planning. Oh. Permission. They, they can't. They can't get. A, they can't get planning permission for a stand doing that side of the goals because it's in the Grange with blast zone. <laughs> that is blowing my mind. That is, only been... that is Scottish football at its best, though. <laughs> yeah, I've been once, and you know what? It's funny because the SPL, you know, gave folk at rules they needed a certain size stadium. Rod Stewart didn't. And I think Rod Stewart's a bit bigger than half the SPL, you know what I mean? And he was quite happy to play at the old folk at stadium. So take so, note, Roger Mitchell, if you're watching now, you made a complete mistake doing that. So has a. Uh... Little Mix. My daughter's been to see Little Mix twice at the Falkirk Stadium. Yeah, and did Elton and and John no play there as well? Yeah, he did. Elton he did. John I didn't go to that, but he did play. The, the rocket man himself. Um, so, I let's get back. I'll, I'll bring, Paul's brought up a comment. A state of mind is just 13 subs short of 13,600 on YouTube. This month's prize is a Fratelli's Costello Music Platinum Disc, which has been presented to John Fratelli. So last last month we had the Urban Hymns a, a Platinum Disc Prize, and yep. that was that was run by that was won won by Mick Nolan from Belfast. So Mick's going to get a great prize. So this is a great prize this month as well. So if you have this subscribed, please subscribe and tell other people to subscribe to go into a prize draw to win the, this fantastic platinum disc. And if ever you if, if ever you needed evidence that the draw isn't rigged, think about the postage you'll be here for Paul. <laughs> I've already signed the Urban Hymns, Hymns platinum disc all the way to Belfast. <laughs> so you can't say we don't play fair. It would be cheaper driving it to Belfast himself, getting into the state of mind will be on there, driving it to Belfast to hand deliver it than what is going to cost the cost of it. Is there a Brexit tax? tax? No, <laughs> I don't know. Customs and excise. Um, Drew, Mark, uh, Drew, MACFC. I still hate Mick Nolan. I think there's a lot of people who are not hate but are extremely jealous yeah, of, you Mick know what Nolan, you mean. of Mick Nolan at this precise moment in time. But no. it's another fantastic prize this month. That's the thing. It just shows you, you hit the subscribe button, you're in with a chance to win unique prizes, stuff that no one else can possibly have because oh, that is it. We're not getting away replica kits here. No way. We're getting away, oh, we're oh, getting away oh, one-offs. Oh. We're getting away one-offs. <laughs> you know it. You spoke about thoroughbreds earlier on and Martin O'Neill's a thoroughbred, but this was the, deb- the debuts for Chris Sutton and Hughes Valharn. And we spoke about big use yards a couple of weeks ago. So I think we really need to actually focus on Big Sutton tonight because I sometimes don't think Big Sutton gets the credit he deserves for the number of years he was at Celtic and how he was a, a, a mainstay of mm-hmm. Martin O'Neill's Celtic. Mm-hmm. He was, looking back now, he was a, he was a statement signing when you actually look back on it. So at this time, you, Big, Big Yoss had signed on the Friday for £3.8 million and went straight into the team on the Sunday. From uh, Rhoda JC? From Rhoda JC, that's it. Uh, Steve Walford, <laughs> Walford had also a- arrived, uh, part of Martin O'Neill's back, uh, uh, backroom team. So he had arrived during the week, so he joined the backroom team, which was, as I've said plenty of time, at that point was Tommy Burns and Matt Reaper, who had just announced his retirement from playing as well. I don't remember we spoke about Reaper or... Uh, was that last yeah, week? Yeah, about Reaper, aye. Uh, aye, so he had, he had just run out, announced his retirement from playing this week also. 
before this game, and he was part of the backroom staff as well. Um, and we were also getting linked with new goalkeepers on the, on a day that we signed a new goalkeeper. We were getting linked with Richard Wright, the Ipswich goalkeeper, who, wow. ended, who ended up going to Arsenal. Arsenal. And another Australian, Mark Bosnich, was, That's the two, right. was the two goalkeepers that we were getting linked with. Again, Richard Wright was a cracking goalkeeper at that time. Am I right in thinking Mark Bosnich was at Man United down again? Was he back there? I know he'd been at Villa, or has he just joined? Because he joined Chelsea, I think, instead of us. Hey, I'm not 100% sure. I would have said he was at Villa. I maybe would have ah, said he was at Villa. But maybe he just joined Chelsea that summer. But he was definitely at Chelsea. I, I always had it in my head that he went to Chelsea when we were linked with him. But I didn't know if he'd went back to Man U for it. Because I'm sure he had a cameo... I knew he started, did he was at Man U before Villa? And then I think he went back and had a cameo year there, but I can't remember mm. when it was. But I mean, you look at the quality of those keepers, and Celtic were just operating at a level again that we hadn't we hadn't really seen. I know uh, Berkovic joined for 5.75 million the year before, so he was still even in this lineup, what the second highest transfer mm. fee we've ever paid. They just uh, you just felt Celtic, this game, the first of that season was, we were aside just about to enter a new stratosphere, if you like, for uh, what, what, what Celtic were, uh, Celtic sports were, were used to. Uh, I mean, again, Richard Wright didn't have a very good time at Arsenal, if I remember correctly, when he ended up going to Arsenal. And Mark Bosnett's career sort of downward spiralled and from his peak in the mid-90s to, to this point. Um, but you can show that we signed Chris Sutton and when I was reading the match report for this game, the the, the, the journalist actually wrote uh, <laughs> English, England, England's international striker Chris Sutton, the £6 million man, scored his first goal for Celtic. So he was still classed as an England internationalist at this point, even though he never had a cap. It was only a B internationalist then. But he was still it was still a top it was still a top quality uh, signing. Did he ever get a cap? No. He played a B international. Then a f- and then he told no, him no, Am I getting that wrong? He, he got a cap, then he was I'm asked. sure he was cap. Uh, uh, he got a cap, then he was asked to play a B internationalist. Uh, internationalist uh, he told Glenn and Hoddle. Hoddle. And he told Glenn Hoddle to stuff it, and he was never he was never considered again. Um, but Do you know why he did that? He was no. joint top scorer in the EPL at that time with Robbie Fowler. And yet the strike, I've read Sutton's book, the strikers chosen though, now, I might get one of these wrong, right? You know I might. But I think the strikers chosen was like Sir Sheringham, uh, Andy Cole, and there was no. one other one, Les Ferdinand, I think it might have been, that you're like, wait the now. And they were still getting picked ahead, even though he was currently, uh, I think he'd won the Golden Boot with Norwich before that. So he was an established striker. He won the Golden Boot with Norwich. He then wins the league with Blackburn, and then in 97, 98 sort of period under Hoddle, he's still basically sixth choice. He's sitting there going, wait the now. And he's knowing I'll be playing for the Bees. So he comes in and says, Heske? No, nah, not at that point. No, no, no. No, no, no. no not at that point. No, it's Heske. Heske was someone that... See if, I hadn't, see if Emil Heske hadn't played for England at the World Cup 2002 and they'd picked a guy who'd just been the main reason other than Henrik himself, that he scored 53 goals the year before, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> they, England would have been a far better team because what a foil Sutton would have been for her, uh, for, for Michael Owen at that yeah, World, World Cup 2002. I mean, he's streets ahead of Heskey. Streets ahead, but at the time when he declined, um, at the time when he de- declined Hoddle, it was, you looked at the list, you thought he's joint top scorer with Fowler. And I think, ironically, Fowler wasn't getting many starts for England either. I think that it seemed I think it seemed like Hoddle had his favourites. Bye, sorry. No more we doing that. No, no, I like going doing rabbit holes, man. You're probably right there. I mean he kept on he kept on picking Dan Anderson. Uh, Do you know when well. Shearer you know when Shearer played at Euro ninety six? 
uh-huh. against the first game they played were against Switzerland, I think England did. He hadn't scored an international goal for over two years. It's funny that it's funny how he was always picked. Mm-hmm. It's funny how tournaments can change players as well. I remember World Cup '86, Gary Lineker, expo- when he was getting abuse off the English press. Then he scored that hat trick against Poland, and that was him. He's, he's in one career, basically took off at that point. Eh? Wow. So, so it, sometimes it shows you if a manager's got faith in you. And this keeps on going back to you. He can eventually come good. Jim Hannaway says Big Chris hasn't changed then. No, but Big Big Sutton's always batted with a straight bat. He always yeah, has. Um, uh, he, he's he's never missed any targets. And as as he was show, as was shown over his number of years at Celtic, where he was a tough, uncompromising character, both on and off, both on and off the park. Um, there, there's been some stories about, but he has got a sense of humour. Um, dry, dry. He sense has got a sense of humour. I've been fortunate enough. Uh, me and Paul, I'm going to say, I'm going to do the job of the stars here. Uh, that we've we've done a couple of gigs with Chris Sutton, and I can quite safely say that his TV persona is an amplified version of himself uh, as a persona. It is I not. Got a feeling. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, if you know what I mean, if you, if you meet Chris Sutton, he's not the Chris Sutton you see on the TV being sure. uh, uncompromising character. It is a sort of persona that he's honed to be on the telly. And I think sometimes you need that. And I think sometimes you've got to make a, make, make like Robbie Savage as a class clown. That's how he keeps on getting the gigs. Ian Wright is Ian Wright. He's just this bubbly, over, overactive thyroid who just keeps on getting on the who keeps on Maker getting the Richards the who laughs at everyone. Aye. But he seems like the, he seems like someone you would want to spend company with. It's a brilliant that's a brilliant yeah. trait to have, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, so, yeah, you're right. They've all got their own wee traits, mm-hmm. haven't they? Which don't necessarily mean that's, that's what exactly like. what they're like. Mm-hmm. No, I get what that means. No, that's a fair point. But but Chris, as that decision shows I'm refusing a B cap. He shows he's a man of principle, a man of conviction. And the fact that he made the move to Celtic when he could have stayed in England shows oh. he, it showed the amount of faith that he had in Martin O'Neill. Martin O'Neill's uh, dairy tongue getting him to Celtic, talking him into it, saying, come, come to Celtic, I'll re- resurrect your career. And yep. in the 60, what was it, the 66 minute of this game, yep. he, he scored the first goal for Celtic. Now, the previous season, we had finished 21 points behind, I think it was. 21, I'm sure it was. Uh, the worst season, in, worst season in the last 20 years until last season. And from the first whistle that day, we were a different animal. A completely different animal there or so. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. Just quickly, I'll touch on the fact you mentioned 66 minute, because it's funny how much your brain plays tricks with you. When I watched the highlights, I could have sworn that goal was in the last 10 minutes of the game. And so I, just, I was like, 66? I thought it was like a late winner for some reason. But anyway, that's another story. Um, there's a moment where Alan Stubbs is involved in a bit of a, a tangle, shall we say. But it's full throttle tackler. And then before you know it, Stubbs has three Celtic players around him outside the Dundee United box. And it could have escalated, it didn't. But what you've seen then was the sign of things to come. Celtic had became a team of men. And they were also a team of men who happened to be extremely hard. And that was that all just went hand in hand. And they were basically now saying the days of being bullied are over. And it's very poignant when you watch the highlights. I know it's not a big it wasn't a big moment in the game by any stretch. But see when you watch the highlights back, Kev, you look with a different set of, you know, a different lens, don't you? And you look and I went, look at the reaction there. Boom, three players in. Stubbs is like raging. Two other players are now in. There's now three Dungeon 8 players. Oh, it could have escalated, it didn't. But you just thought, this is like 18 minutes gone. And you thought, that was the sign of things to come. Not only is this team going to get all the belief in their ability 
where they've been told Martin O'Neill to not be scared, when they've been told by Martin O'Neill to stamp your authority in more ways than one. That became really, really poignant when you were watching it. Com- compare that to the tackle by the poor podcast host on Saturday night on our captain, and the only person to react was the captain. The only person Unbelievable to react was, was the captain. There was nobody there in Halliday's face. There, there was there was nobody there actually like backing the captain up, and it was quite quite strange. On before the game started on Saturday night, the Sky showed the game we got beat one nothing at Time Castle under Brendan Rodgers when Naismith done Johnny Hayes. Then Naismith was growling and snarling at everybody on the pitch. Remember that. And Remember that. At, and you look at that that day, and nobody, uh, no, nobody, uh, nobody had to like. St- st- nobody stood up to to Naismith that day. They let him away with it. And nothing's changed since then, apart from when Bruni was there, obviously. But now we've got to sign players who will actually, when something like that happens to Callum McGregor, we've got to have a pilot. We've, got to, have, we, we've got to have guys there that are willing to stand up. I, 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 we all want us to play nice, brilliant football, but sometimes you've got to back up your teammates. Yeah, absolutely agree with you because see the guys that can play nice football, I also want them to have a mentality and a mentality that means I'm in this not just to play pretty football and hopefully we'll win the game but it'll be through playing pretty football. That's brilliant. But I also want them to care. I want to care about their teammate alongside them. I want to care about the man in the trenches alongside them. I want them to be rolling their sleeves up going, you're not going to do that. I have commented and I've laughed at it at times to be fair. Alan McGregor running at the halfway line. He's running at the halfway line when a decision's been made more times than any keeper I've ever seen in my life. It, like, it's unbelievable. He'll fly at the box going nuts. But once he's going that far, what's the reaction of his teammates? They all do the same. And mm-hmm. I think you get guys like Joe Hart, James McCarthy, Wise, older, he'll go, we know how to influence things. And it's not because we want cheating, by the way. No, it's no. you want the referee to see when they've made a mistake. And you want them to know you're going to get hounded every time you do. That's what we want. And it's not about cheating. I want. I don't want Andy Aldi sent off because Celtic players have told him to. I want the referee to realise how bad it was. And if that means it's took that for the, you know, the penny to drop, nothing wrong with that, you know. And there, this there, side of that in abundance. There was a lack um, of there, there, there was a lack of reaction. If, if there would have been an hysterical reaction from the Celtic side, there might have been a different outcome. Yeah, there yep. might have been, but then Brown Warrior, usual contributor, comes in. Ralston will put the boot in, but unfortunately for Tony Ralston, it's usually doing it the opposition's corner flag when the ball's going out for a corner. He decides to he decides to foul somebody. Um, Brian Watt brings up brings up a great point about Chris Sutton. What you'd give for a Chris Sutton in the team today could, could trust him to win the ball in the air in both boxes and you could, eh? That's, no. He played a number of positions for Celtic, eh? Well, I mean, it's not just in the air as well, Brian. You know, as much as I agree with that, you look at how he used to bring the ball down on his chest but while shielding. I mean, the, the, tonight's example was uh, Jason DeVos. Absolute animal of a player, <laughs> ripped. He was he was huge and he could mix it. Fair mm-hmm. enough. And big Sutton and him have a great tussle. And he was one of those. Brian's absolutely right. I mean, he can win it in the air, but I also like the fact he could shield it. He could control the ball because he was actually a good technician as well. Sutton. That mm-hmm. was the thing. Well, once we once we'll, we'll move, we'll, we'll get to Tanadice two thousand. But I'll just bring up this with Jim Hannaway. Agree, Kevin Boyce. Play looks good, up tempo. Just need a bit more dig, and we're there. Hopefully, yep. we get that, Jim. Hopefully, that we do get that. Uh, now, I want to talk about the kits. Dundee United. Thank you. I'm glad you want to talk about the kits. Me too. Right, on you go. You go first. Let's let's uh, you, you go first about the kits. What, what's so, your thoughts about the kits? So obviously it's striking that both teams are playing in their away kit. Neither team needs to play in their away kit unless Dundee United. From I've not I looked into it. And I couldn't really find any reasons for it. I don't know if you managed to, but Dundee United 
it turns out I presume they must have a tradition of when they start because they were done the Hibernian, weren't they? Yes. But their first kit isn't a green kit either. So what? I presumed it was a homage to their first ever kit, but from what I read, it's not. And that season, that was not that was nothing but just a bit of marketing from what I took from it of their new away kit. It wasn't an away kit, it was to celebrate the one hundredth anniversary. They wore it as the away kit all year. Did they wear, wear it as the away kit all, all year? The season they wore it as the away kit. There was oh. a there was an orange home kit. Mm. So I guess I did check it out because I'm glad you brought it up because it was like and then I realised, you know, Dundee United and Celtic when they normally play at Town Dice just both wear their home kits. But they're now both in their away kits, which told me it was a Dundee United decision. But there was two kits that year for Dundee United and there still was an orange and black one. I'm and the sure, green one. I am sure it was something to do with their centenary and that's why they were on, on, on the opening day of the season. Uh, because, because as you say I think it was the centenary of when they were formed as Dundee Hibernian and they wore this kit to celebrate that on the first day of the season but then cool. it got us to have a look at like the fantastic golden green kit which became synonymous with that season which got better and better <laughs> as that season went on that kit was just utterly gorgeous eh so, Kev, here's the big question. Two kits with those tones take you back to two memories of the same era. What one do you want? That one or the one Henrik scores in Boa Vista? Or the one Hartson scores at Celta Vigo? Because remember, it's the same toned kit, but one's got NTL, I think. Is it Digital Home? Forget me yes. if I'm wrong. That's Something like that. That's and that one's got the big NTL font and they're slightly different in styles. Same format, obviously. I'm going to put my neck in line and say I much prefer the kit from 2000 to the one in 2003. What one brings back the better memories? Hard to say because while Seville is such a monumental thing, this season is the seed getting planted for Seville. This mm -hmm. season is when we realised Wow, we're huge again. And that top, it is, it's gorgeous, but it does bring back. Right. It's just, what are you thinking? For me, it's a 2000 kit every day of the week. Right. A 2000 kit every day of the week. I thought the 2003 kit was too busy. I think there was too much going on in it. The, two, the 2000 kit for me is just, when I think of Mark O'Neill's treble, I think of that kit. Yeah, I think you like it. Come on the hoops, another great Celtic channel. NTL, NTL home digital all day. So he goes for the two thousand. He goes for the two thousand three kit. Eh? But I bought only one of those kits, and it was the two thousand one. I never bought the two thousand and three kit. The two thousand one so, is a thing of beauty. But I mean, obviously, you know, come on the hoops is quite right. I mean, the one from two thousand and three, it just. You think of another wave of memories. Do you know what I mean? The teams evolved by then. But we're almost... That kit was a, was when we were almost in an expectancy that firstly the kit would be good and Celtic would be brilliant. In 2000, we didn't expect a gorgeous kit and an amazing team. It was all just, this is brilliant. Where did all this come from, you know? Hopefully, and something that you'll be able to read towards the end of this year, I talk about this kit in great length. <laughs> so uh, wow. I'll, I'll, I'll leave that out there. Um, cool. So the first goal, the, the first goal that we actually that, that we scored that season comes back comes to Henrik Henrik Larson. It is Henrik Larson, who's just returned from a broken leg, who went to the Euros that summer. And, and, oh, shut up, just move my microphone up, and uh, and, and came back. <laughs> um, so this comes with Paul Lambert, European Cup winner. Paul Lambert <laughs> breaks through the middle of the park. He gets clattered by David Hanna, who who actually mm -hmm. had left Celtic a year before and went back to Dundee United. Funnily enough, Hanna's career after Dundee United took him to Cyprus. Yep. Uh, Ross County, St. Johnson, Bury, Brecon and Montrose. 
afterwards. So he got a boot a bit after that. So he, he brings does. he brings down Paul Lambert and gets booked after after Larson scores. The, the ball breaks to Sutton and Sutton goes into the box and he squares the ball to Henrik Larson, who's on the corner of the right hand side of the box. Sutton gets taken out as well by Jason DeVos. Uh, at, at the edge mm-hmm. of the box and Larson first time curls the ball in at the bottom corner it's a great goal an absolute peachy goal some interesting points on it Sutton as running or trying to run past Jason DeVos does a step over with his left foot you know R9 material that's what I was seeing Kev you know mm-hmm. he, he does a step over which you just don't really associate with Sutton the ball sort of breaks to Henrik. Henrik, who's un, un uh, commonly for him, got his shirt hanging out that game as well. You don't remember Henrik Larson playing with his shirt? I wrote that, didn't I? I, I wrote that, didn't I? That's the first thing I noticed. I went, his shirt's on. Uh, All right, it's really noticeable. But looked- the finish, I mean, this is not meant to be strong foot. This is his left foot, which we know he could do it with both, but. I mean, that is absolute instinct. And at this point, Henrik came back as a god because we've always said, and not because, um, not because, I mean, his career had already started to go on a trajectory at Celtic that was putting him up there anyway. But then absence, as we spoke about, makes the heart grow fonder. Mm-hmm. Henrik came back on a magic carpet, basically. Do you know what I mean? From 10 months out, and I think he that he actually embraced that pressure. I think he wanted. He went. I am the man, eh? and you just look at the confidence. This is the first game of the season, and you look at that off the cuff, off the cuff way of doing it with the left peg. Oh, brilliant! Wow, it's a great goal. Uh, I'm going to bring up a couple of comments here, Russell. Uh, yes, Michelle Lee. Let's try and be a bit positive about the signings today, guys. Instead of booting ourselves in the homos, we were positive about the signings at the start of the show. So I, I kind of think we can be anything else. No. Jim, ha- Jim Hannaway actually brings up a great point, and this is true. Did Hannah not go up for a medal with a Jers top one time? Yes, he did. When Dundee United, I think, won the Scottish Cup in 1994. Yes, he, he collected his one. He collected his winners' medal wearing a Rangers top. There's two ways of that. We could go really deep on that, Kev, right, and go, "Oh, I mean, that must make him. That must make him like that." Or see if you just don't support Celtic or Rangers, right? You don't give us stuff about them. I've seen plenty of times teams in other tops. I'll give you an example. When Gascoigne scores that goal when he lobs it over Hendry in Euro '96. He walks off the game in a Scotland jersey. Aye, sometimes folk don't. Sometimes folk aye. don't get it. David Hanna was twenty at that point as well, because he was born in nineteen seventy four, and you know I know that for a fact. Cause I'm weird with the years of births, so he was maybe nineteen, maybe twenty, and I, I actually struggle with that mindset of how is he meant to know I'm going to sign for Celtic in two years? Why does he necessarily need to care about Celtic or Rangers? I, I would counter that by, by saying Dundee United won the Scottish Cup for the first time in their history. Why would you even think about ch- swapping your top? Naive, eh, mate? I made a lot of mistakes at 20 years old. And if I, I had won a Scottish Cup in the midst of it, my ego would be out of control. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe his was too. I've seen you on this podcast, mate. Jesus. <laughs> I wouldn't want to see you winning the Scottish Cup. I'm going to bring up Keith to come on the hoops again. Right after this, Martin O'Neill, we saw the, the what became the iconic Martin O'Neill jump. So Keith come on the hoop says, can't beat Martin wearing socks tucked into tracky bottoms. That jump. It's a great jump. If you ever try to do it, well, I, I call it a leap. Well, oh, it is a leap, eh? It's like it's a, a salmon. A, a salmon returning to its spawning ground. Do you know what's mad? Martin O'Neill was dressed up as Brian Clough. <laughs> Right? But I don't know at that age who Brian Clough is, so I don't see that at all. I look back and went, he's dressing up as his favourite manager. See when mm-hmm. I seen Paul Lambert do the same thing. <laughs> 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 I thought, you're this what are you doing, man? 
Even maybe Paul Lambert cut a bit wearing glasses for a while. Yeah. Or you could just tell he didn't need them. <laughs> <laughs> but that that all aside, I mean that's just a wee observation. But I mean, O'Neill's leap was, you're absolutely right. What he was also doing then, and I know I don't get me wrong, I don't think he could help it, but subconsciously was he completely was engaging with the fans because you realise you had someone in there who cared just as much, if not more than we did. You know, all his ego and his gravitas and all that was put to one side in those moments. He lost all social awareness because he was that buzzing at Celtic scoring. I think that really resonated with supporters. <laughs> it did. It was some jump. I mean, if you've ever, if you've ever tried to replicate the jump, it's extremely difficult to do. When you oh, actually try and, and, and do it. So it must be like, for me, it just must have just be the pure adrenaline and emotion of the jump that makes them actually do it. I mean, I'm 45. If I tried to do it now, I would probably end up smashing my two kneecaps and be, be, carried, <laughs> be carried off to the Fourth Valley Hospital to, to spend about six weeks uh, <laughs> in, a, in, in a wheelchair. Uh, Brown Warrior comes in comes in again. The chav looked before it was a hang. Uh, it's a still what? game Neds, eh? It's a still game Neds, look. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, he comes back in. Seriously, every dealer in my toon dresses like Martin when we won that game round here. <laughs> 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 oh, Martin O'Neill inspired a generation of meds. We've never, we never actually thought about that. We never knew. Who knew? Who knew? <laughs> oh, brilliant, brilliant. We'll go to the second half. I'm not even going to talk about the, the Dundee United goal um, because I think your setting goal is like a, it's a force of nature. It's a relentless goal when you actually watch it from us getting the corner kick to the ball ending up in the back of the net. It's, it's, it's like Dundee United are like a boxer on the ropes, just getting plummeled and eventually, eventually you're going down, eventually this ball is going into the back of the net. Uh, and again, as you say, your mind does play tricks on you uh, because... I thought it was in the last 10 minutes as well. I really did think it was in the did last you? 10 minutes. Aye. Um, I never went to this game. Um, I did have a ticket for this game, but I never went. The reason being, I'd started a new job and I was going six weeks. I was going for weekly pay to monthly pay and I was going six weeks without wages. Big and, jump. and I probably made my first ever adult decision in my life to say, I can't go to this game because basically I've got no money to actually mm-hmm. go to this game. So I, 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 if I look back on it, that's probably my first ever adult decision where Celtic didn't come before everything. Um, as it turned out, I got pied that Friday before the game on the Sunday and I could have went anyway. But I'd already gave up my ticket. <laughs> 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 uh, it wasn't brilliant at the time, but I still jumped about uh, the new market because I watched this game in the pub, the new market in Bannockburn, and uh, we went absolutely mental at this goal. So this goal, we get a corner kick, and Stan Petroff swings it in. It's funny to see Stan Petroff taking corner kicks as well uh, in this in, in this game. Uh, Petroff was the one taking quite a few. I, th- I kind of he used to always go near post. It used to drive me bonkers. See, what, and, and later on, honestly, whenever you see Petrov over the, the corner kick, he would always try and whip it right to the near post. Oh, I remember him taking plenty. Mm, maybe that's my you mind. Playing, maybe that's just my mind playing tricks on me again. Oh, eh? I, do, I don't like him taking it, I'll be honest. So, strangely, you should say this. This corner actually is a short corner. And we try to play it in the second time. And it gets cleared out to the halfway line. Uh, Jackie Mack picks it up and tries to play a ball through to Larson. Larson oversteps the ball and the ball gets cleared again. Lambert then plays it to Alan Stubbs. And Stubbs mm-hmm. crosses it into the, into the back post. And there's, there's, a, there's a bit of a stramash at the back post when Sutton jumps with divorce from the ball. Yes. And, it, and, and it kind of half gets cleared again to the edge of the box. At the edge of the box, me, Jackie Max, ran for the half wide line to follow the ball in, and he hits the ball in the half volley. And Alan, Alan Kuhn, actually, it's a, it's a like, fantastic save. 
And another that's, one. That's another brilliant save. So as this ball's bouncing away, us as a support, the support in the shed behind the goal, we're all going, oh, that's that chance away. Stefan Maia then bursts in and the commentator says it's a cross. I think it's a shot. He actually has. So, oh, yeah. so, so, so Maia r- rifles the ball towards goal and Sutton, who's managed to get back on his feet after the sort of stramash that he's had with the force, has a wee wrestle in match room and tucks the ball in at the back of the at the back post to cue absolute bedlam. But for the corner kick to the goal, it is 45 seconds of constant Celtic pressure. Dundee United were never withstanding that. Never withstanding. And I reckon Dundee United actually thought they got away with it when, when Cole made that save. I thought they thought, that's us, we're out of here now. We, we're going to... Our luck has changed. It's hard to say because, to be totally honest to you, the amount of saves Coleman made by then, if you look at the ones in the first half, there might have been a wee bit of you thinking, it's our night. Do you know what I mean? Because he is having a superhuman game at this point. Mm-hmm. The thing is, with Sutton, when he scores at that back post, it is just... Sutton at his best going I want that ball more than you and I am stronger than you it's because Sutton would wrestle you know, at that point in time with a wrestle to anyone to win to win a ball like that that was just his he was great at doing things like that and again mm-hmm. we've always spoke about like, Kev, like do you know what I mean like players getting off on the right foot strikers joining the club starting with a goal Scott Sinclair being such a glaring one in my mind. Then Belly with that penalty, which I think was the anniversary it was shared today against, I think it was a star or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, or, you know, make your debut, score early. Sutton's not only just scored early, it turns out to be a winner. That is the foot to get off on, isn't it? That is how you start your career if you're going to be a forward. It's get off at that and the, the doubts are all just getting further and further eradicated. And... I think you're absolutely right. The 45 seconds thing, or a minute, however long it was, the word is relentless there. Mm-hmm. Utterly relentless. And it shows that there's been an attitude shift already. This is game day one. And we're basically playing after only 65 minutes, right? Even though the first half, by the way, was wave after wave, 65 minutes, there's almost a desperation to get back in front, like a league title depends on it. That's how it felt. And that's what Martin O'Neill, how quick he was at instilling that in the team that he had at the time, which when you look at it, as you said at the start of the show, only has uh, debutants, Joss Valharan and Chris Sutton. The the team that day... Martin O'Neill has got a reaction of everyone else in the squad. And a lot of them, you look at the likes of Ayal Berkovic who started that game, Probably know they ain't going to last. They probably know, because Martin O'Neill doesn't mince his words, that you might not be the guy for me long term. Mm-hmm. But yet you've got a team pulling in the same direction and understand what the manager's trying to teach them. And yes, he's on his own. But guess what? He only got his assistant manager, Wolf, for that week, like you just said. Mm-hmm. He wouldn't, he wouldn't get John Robertson for another couple of weeks after that. The no Celtic- excuses. The Celtic team that day um, that I'll, I didn't read out earlier on was Gould, Stubbs, Valhan, Tom Boyd, Stefan Maia, Jackie Mack, Paul Lambert, Eil Berkovic, who was replaced with Tommy Johnson on 64 minutes, Stan Petroff, Larson and Sutton up front. Uh, the subs were Stuart Kerr, bizarrely enough, uh, Bobby Petter, Oliver Tebley and Matt Burchill. That was that. That was a bench uh, that night. So, but look at that front two, Larson and Sutton. What a front two! Uh, a front two that we'll struggle to ever see better in our lifetime, anyway. Of uh, a, a perfect a partnership. Part, a partnership. I think he's just as as potent as Henrik Larson at this time for Celtic. I think the sign in a ma- uh, sign of looking back when the story's now complete and there's full stops and the book's been printed and stuff like that, Chris Sutton was 
a statement signing by Martin O'Neill, and he was just as important to Martin O'Neill as Henrik Larson, even though Chris Sutton will never admit that. No, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's unsurprising that in the foreword of Chris Sutton's book that I was telling you I've read his autobiography, it is done by no none other than Henrik Larson. Not surprising, is it? Because, you know, as much as Sutton would never, like, say, oh, you know, it, you know, it was all down to Henrik, Henrik Larson's someone who will 100% acknowledge that Chris Sutton took his game to that next level. It's been... It's a partnership that you look back on that was actually enhanced by Hartson. But that, that we'll do that in another show. But the first time ever you've seen the three of them together was at Ewood Park. And that's when you realised, oh, we're now, we're now playing a completely different tune here. You know, all three it turns out can play together. And that is 100% down the intelligence, in particular, of Sutton's football brain. And as much as Henrik obviously had one as well, was a, was a genius. Sutton seemed always to know where Henrik Larson would be. You could blindfold him and you would know where Henrik Larson, when he was making his run, you know, what direction he's going in, where I'm flicking it to behind my back. It was it was just a colossal partnership. And as I say, you always have to look at the start. And the start was a good one. Both players were the both scorers and they just felt between them we're on to something here. De- definitely, I can't. Uh, the, the best partnership I've seen watching Celtic um, in my lifetime. Um, I, I saw a lot of partnerships in the eighties. As I say, Brian McLear was my favourite player in the eighties, and I thought he was a great striker. But I can't really remember a partnership like this. No, which which changed a movement of a club. Uh, actually, like the foundation of our club was built on NATO up front, and the yep. success that we had under Martin O'Neill uh, was built definitely on NATO. And we had, he had a great nickname, and we called him the Evil Genius just because of his persona. Of like, I mean, he was a bit of a playboy uh, when he was younger. And some of the stories, if you actually Google Chris Sutton at the times he was at Norwich and that, he was a bit of a playboy. I think his wife was a glamour model. As, as well, I think she was a, a Sun Page Free model eh, as well. Go. And he, he was a bit of a bad boy, and he actually admits that himself eh, that, that, he, that he admits that. And then he turned up, when he came up to Scotland, he stayed on a farm, he had pigs and chickens. And, mm-hmm. I remember he, that. He's he just sort of flipped his whole. He's now like he, he was new insular, he, he was the outgoing guy that he was down in London, and it's. Fantastic, and we got the benefit. We got the best years of Chris Sutton, and Chris Sutton admits that his best time in his football career was at Celtic. And for Chris Sutton to come out and say that the best striker he's ever played with is Henrik Larsson, when he's played with Alan Shearer, who's probably one of the best strikers that Britain's produced in the last how many how, how many years? Yeah, that's testament to Henrik, and it's not just because Chris Sutton didn't like Alan Shearer. And they liked Henrik. I think that was really like just a fact. It was a fact. Yes, <laughs> it was a fact. It's um, just a fact. I love Sutton. Um, I, I still like him now. Sometimes I think he plays to the gallery quite a bit. But hey, mm-hmm. every, everybody's got to make a buck here and there. Eh? So they've got to do something to keep the bailiffs for the door. I agree with most of the things he says as a pundit. I'll be honest to you. And it wouldn't be right to do Scream Celica without promoting the YouTube video of him phoning in Clyde One when it's, um, I think it's Jerry McCulloch actually of Celtic TV now who's hosting and it's Derek Johnson who's the pundit and Sutton phones. This video is seven and a half minutes. I implore anyone to type into YouTube tonight. We'll talk about music and all that. We want you to listen to songs. But Scream of Selk is just not just not about that. If you do anything tonight... It's about anything it's about Chris Chris Sutton, to be. Chris Sutton, Derek Johnson, Clyde One. Oh, it's the best thing ever. Anyone that can say to Derek Johnson, you're a puppet, you're a charlatan, you're a party <laughs> political broadcaster, Derek. Just tell the truth. <laughs> the thing is, eh, it's quite obvious that Big Chris is an intelligent guy. 
and they can Absolutely. handle himself in situations like that. I mean, you've seen him. I mean, he, he does six or six. Is it still called six on six, or is it still? Yeah, I think so. Is it still called six? Six I mean, or six I think it's still called. I mean, I mean, you hear him on that, and he can he can own anybody. He can really own anybody on that. Any pundit, you see him on the BBC and that. You, you see him on like uh, BT. He can actually own anybody. He's got a comment for anybody, and he can back it up. Um, Paul's told the story before. Um, he went to Hamilton one night when BT were doing Celtic v Hamilton and to see behind the scenes at BT what BT were doing. And he says, Chris Sutton was so well prepared, it was frightening. It was the only one that he saw sitting with notes going through, he had done his homework and he was sitting going through the notes of the teams and all the homework that he'd done and he says, on the other hand, you had somebody like Alan McCoy who appeared five minutes before kickoff. Like, that's just my irrational what Alan McCoy hate when coming in there again, eh? But I'm, I'm, I'm allowing that to slip. Uh, so I love Big Sutton. Uh, I think he's a Celtic. Great. I'm no saying legend. He's a great. He, he, he made a he made a major part in this football club in the 20th century, the 21st yeah. century in Martin O'Neill's time. So for me, I'll always love him. I will always love Chris Sutton, and he's made him welcome to come on and talk music with us. But I think in what kind of music that he would be into, that's quite difficult to tell, eh? That mm. is hard to tell. I mean, I've him, got a feeling he might be quite dad. That like dad rock, you know. Like I, I think he might. Like I think he might listen. To, like you know, the 20, 20 biggest motorway songs ever, or something like that. You know what I mean? And think that's music. I don't think it'd be particularly cool. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Jim, Jim Hammond, yeah. impersonation, Boise, Buffs the boys. Get I, I may as well bring up the good ones, Boise. Great impression. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just stick with the good ones. I'll go sleep the night, mate. <laughs> uh, oh, Drew. Drew comes in. Oh, no, that was. <laughs> off. So, uh, Suey's calling you a big toff. Uh, no, it's called Sutton a big toff. Oh, that's not like he's calling you a big toff. I think. Oh, no. Suey's not calling me a bit. No, Suey, well, he's not calling me a big toff. Where's the, where's the one that. Where's the, where's the comment that I wanted to bring up that was saying that he's into. Oh, there it's. Power ballads. Drew says yeah. he's probably into power. Journey. More, uh, Journey, yeah, yeah. More Born to be wild in that. I could hear people say stuff like that. You know what I mean? He's got a Top Gear album, ain't he? If Chris Sutton wants to come on and prove us wrong, then we'll more than happily take a, take him up on it. We'll go to music now. And we yep. talk about... We, 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 uh, oh, I need to bring this up with Quad, but he likes Rebel Tunes, Kev. Maybe he does. <laughs> Maybe he does. You never know. We'll need to ask him what's his favourite Rebel Tune uh, if, we, if we ever get to speak to him. Uh, We'll, we'll go on to this other legend of the um, the musical fear who actually had a Celtic link. He did have a Celtic link, which we'll get on to. Bob Marley was... Bob, Arley, Bob Marley's compilation album, uh, Legend, was in the chart this week. Okay? Uh, and I had, at this point, had spent 410 weeks in the charts since it was released in 1984. In total, it spent 987 weeks in the chart. In the charts, this album is an utter classic. Uh, Legend was released in 1984, and it was a collection of Bob Marley's singles. And uh, what a belter uh, an album! And it's it's a brilliant lesson it's a great lesson it's it's amazing how much cultural significance Bob Marley actually has in this country it is an unbelievable I mean every song on this is a classic every song you could play it to any generation and they'll go I know that song he he, he brung reggae music to to the masses they crossed over I first remember Bob Marley and my dad, who will be watching this, by the way, uh, my dad used to sell hooky tapes, right? He used to, used to, a guy used to deliver these tapes to the house and my dad would sell them in the pub. 
right? So, like, pirate tapes, right? And so my dad used to take orders and he used to have a sheet and he would take the orders and all of that. And the two albums that were his biggest seller were, he'll, he'll probably come back to me and tell me you're wrong. He'll probably phone me the new, forgetting that I'm on air to tell me that I'm wrong here. But the two albums that I can actually remember that were his biggest seller were Bruce Springsteen, Born in the U USA, the album Born in the USA, and Bob Marley. A legend were his two big, two biggest dodgy tape sellers. So I got to know Bob Marley. This is my first introduction to Bob Marley. And mm -hmm. it was quite weird. I've mentioned the new market before. And that there is a picture, and I'll post a picture on Twitter if I, if I can if I find it again. And there's a whole load of us all sitting at the back of not the beer garden, but it was like the cellar, but basically if it was nice, they kicked open the fire exit and everybody went and sat out the back on the, on, on the beer kegs and all of that. Eh? So like an unofficial beer garden. Oh, eh? well, yeah. And, and I remember that like you could hear, uh, the, you could hear status quo and Bob Marley in the same afternoon played from start to finish. I like that, though. And, and like, it, just, it just shows you how much Bob Marley, there's a big cultural significance of Bob Marley. What's obviously, you've got the Jamaican top on, eh? Uh, I, I need to bring, I, I, need, I need to bring That's this right. up. Uh, Brown Warrior, Debbie Does Dallas. No, they weren't the type of, type of tapes, they were music tapes, Brown Warrior. I Russell, sorry, I interrupted that. No, not at all. I mean, it's funny you were saying about doing the pirate cassettes. I mean, I did a bit of that myself at high school. Remember the old Napster world? Yes. So I don't know. I'll not quote my mate's name because I don't want him in trouble. But he must have had in 2003, I mean, at that sort of time, the best broadband that you could ever imagine because he was downloading <laughs> full albums, mix CDs, selling to me for a pound and I was selling them at school for 175 I always look back, Kevin, and ask myself why I wasn't doing it for two quid. <laughs> why it was like it was an inner guilt in me that I couldn't bring myself just to do double the markup. So <laughs> I'm cut a bit instead of jotters in my school bag, just this big pile of CDs. But the boy would do the album cover and that on a bit of paper. He'd like print it off. So we're Brilliant. we're wiring through his parents' broadband usage, <laughs> <laughs> their printer link jet. <laughs> and I've just gone to school forgetting all my homework. But I've got a business to run by this point. I'm 14 years old, mate. I've got lunch to buy. <laughs> you know what I mean? I can't go to the chippy every day if I've not you know what I mean, how am I gonna fold chips and cheese? If I can, if I don't ship some of these albums today, my eyes are on fire. The new someone's bound to buy it. There you go, one seventy five in the back pocket. The high, the hives is a good album, by the way. The high, the hives oh, is a good was. album, right? But I, sorry, just when you said that, it took me back to uh, glory days. A big Bob Marley album. Mm -hmm. Do you know something? When, when we decided we were doing it, uh, when I thought listening to it, I am amazed. I knew every single song. Songs started bringing back memories that I I genuinely had forgotten, Kev, if that makes sense. Because mm. oh, you just think of, I mean, there's one I know you do, like the spoken word and all that. And to me, the bit in Could You Be Loved is very much like spoken word when the female mm. vocalist comes in. The road of life is rocky. You may stumble through. So why unpoint the finger at someone else who's judging you? And we feel we be like that, you know, when we do the streets, you know? Point mm -hmm. the finger at someone else, you know what I mean? I know. You get uh, up there and try it. You know what I mean? So it's like, you, that. Uh, listening to that bit got me going today. And then there was another song called Waiting in Vain. Yes. Greg Taylor, who is booked to play A State of Mind Unplugged at the end of next month. I'm really excited. You'll know who that is. Surely the GT Booze Band for Sterling. Yes, yes, I do know who he is. He's not the, yeah. Celtic, he's not the Celtic left back people. No, not the Celtic left back. If he's playing State of Mind Unplugged, that would be funny. <laughs> Gary Mackay Stevens and the drums. Uh, <laughs> uh, but no, he did a version of that acoustic um, in my pub. And I remember instantly going, I want to know what that song is. I didn't know if it was a Bob Marley cup or anything. I just loved their version. And then when that came on today, it took me back to, to those memories, which I thought was really cool as well. Um 
I mean, obviously you've got the likes of No Woman, No Cry and all that, which no. is a live version. And the funniest thing about that song is the big bit of feedback at one point that happens yes. on the microphone. <laughs> but no, just tremendous songs today. There's another one he did that Liam Gallagher covered, and there's always a Liam Gallagher connection as much as there is a Celtic one with me. I'm trying to think what the name is, though, and I cannot think of it. I know John, John Power covered Redemption Song. Uh, mm -hmm. I've heard John Power for Cass version of Redemption I Song. Done my Paul might know if he's watching. There was, though, I promise you, there's a, Liam did a really good version. I think he wanted to record it. I don't know if he ever did, but he did it live a few times. Well, Sue, who is Liam, and I'm oh, yeah. tribute back, comes in That's and says, John Mystic. Yes, he should know. I mean, he's part, he's the lead singer of Stop the Clocks. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. He plays Liam. <laughs> one of the funniest things about Sue, we went to see Stop the Clocks one night, and after he had done the Oasis set, he says, I'm going to do some cover versions. <laughs> I just can't kill him myself laughing. <laughs> you've, done, you've been doing cover versions all night, mate. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I know. I, I remember Sue, we, I used to get Sue to play in my pub, obviously, Kev, right? And, and some nights he would just come down. I don't know if he was just sussing out. I've maybe had a few and going, <laughs> I'll get away with this here. He would just sit down and go, eh, Boise, eh, kind of weird, because what I'm going to do tonight is eh, I'm just going to play Be Here Now, start to finish. <laughs> Not on the acoustic guitar. <laughs> the full album. I'm like, great idea. Completely forgetting that there's probably a few couples sitting in there, you know what I mean? They're in their 50s going... I thought I know some of the songs he's playing. I've got him playing. I hope I think I know that. That was great. That great. They're no, they're no here to actually hear Magic Pie. Definitely no. <laughs> uh, um, Paul's brought up the comment. Bob Marley was a Celtic fan. Yeah. And this is this is a well known fact. Uh, his son Ronan uh, done it. Uh, done an interview with the Celtic View. Mm -hmm. uh, and Paul comes in. Remember when his son Ronan took to Twitter to verify that picture I posted? So Paul posted a picture of Ronan sitting on Bob's shoulders with a Celtic top on. And um, Ronan done an interview in the Celtic View where he admits that Bob was a massive Celtic fan. And when he toured Europe, he used to bring back VHS copies of the highlights of Celtic games. That's and amazing. He would, and he would tell Ronan about Jock Steen and he would tell Ronan about the Lisbon Lions. And in 1980, I've got it written down here. Uh, anyway, 1981, I think, he bumped into Dixie Deans in Australia. And Dixie Deans didn't have a clue who he was. And Bob Marley started talking to Dixie Deans about Celtic and how he wanted to play at Celtic Park mm -hmm. and how he knew all about Jock, how he knew all about Jock Steen. And Dixie Deans was taken aback that this guy... <laughs> this multi million, this re reggae star, uh, this mega star knew about Celtic all, all the way uh, in Jamaica. I went to Jamaica in 2006, was it, was it 2006? I can't remember. Uh, it was my 40th birthday anyway. No, no, it was my 30th birthday. Jesus, that was, that was, was, a day. was my 30th birthday. And we'd done a day trip to Jamaica. We were on a cruise, Caribbean cruise, and we, and we went to, I'm, I'm sounding like a Tory bastard there, eh? I went on a Caribbean cruise. Eh? Uh, <laughs> champagne socialist, man. Uh, anyway, I. So we went so we went to Jamaica and everybody was going to this waterfall. We decided to do the Bob Marley tour, which took us up to Bob Marley's grave in, in nine mile, uh, way up the top wow. of the mountain way up the top of the mountains. So we basically so we basically drove all the way up this mountain. And Jamaica, I've never seen such uh, I've never seen such poverty in my life. It was just after a, a major storm and the place had been decimated. But all the kids all had stole uniforms. And they were all chasing the bus and, 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 and all of that. Eh? And it turns out that the Bob Marley Foundation made sure that every kid went to school, had a school meal and had a uniform. So the Bob Marley Foundation paid for everything eh, to make sure the kids in Jamaica got an That's education. Fantastic. So we went up the top and I had, a, I had a retro Celtic top on. And when we went into like the, there's like a compound that you go into. 
and you're going into a compound and this boy this boy offered me a bag of grass a carrier bag full of grass for what worked out to be like two quid if I managed to get it back on the boat I would have took it but I was never paid why I was getting it back on the boat uh, so I would have made a fortune back here but anyway the, the tour guide was let's say no on this planet and he had this big hearty laugh and like a big long beard, the, the dreadlocks and that. And he saw my Celtic top and he went, Bob's favourite team. No way. He did. He did and we got to see it. And where, he, where his tomb is, there's a football in the tomb. There's a football sitting on top of the tomb as well. Eh? It was fantastic. I, 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 I was a... Uh, uh, it was a great trip, and I'm actually quite glad. Instead of going to see a stupid waterfall, I went to Nine Mile and saw the, whole, the, right thing, mate. Saw the whole Bob Marley thing. The That's thing, about, thing about it being on a Caribbean tour is like, <laughs> yeah, you hear Bob Marley for a fortnight. <laughs> you hear Bob Marley constantly <laughs> because the, the band on the boats just play Bob Marley. That was great. Uh, the, what, Bob, what the Bob Marley Foundation does for Jamaica is brilliant. Really, really brilliant. Uh, it was. It, it's really good, and always. Any time I hear about Jamaica on the news, if there's been a hurricane or anything like that, I always fear. After seeing it, it's like, aye, I, I, I wonder how these plantations. <laughs> the plantations have all got strange hair plants on the end of mm-hmm. crops <laughs> and all of that. But I often wonder how these farmhouses and all of that survive. Basically, eh, when I hear about a hurricane yeah. and that being there, eh? and it's a rough place. It is a right rough place. We went through this village, and all the guys were just hanging out outside this tavern. And I says to the bus driver, "What's happening there?" He says, "Oh, they're waiting on one of the plantation owners to stop and say I've got two hours work, and one of them will jump on the van and, and go." Wow. And he says, "That's what they do on a daily basis." Eh? It was really quite eye-opening to watch. Uh, to uh, actually see it, but fair play to the Bob Marley Foundation. I'm actually quite glad I done it. It's one of my greatest trips to see the oh, Bob Mar- course, to, see the Bob, uh, to see the Bob Marley tomb. And I right away the the, the tour guide went that Bob's favourite team. That's so quality, Kev. That is quality. That's not the only music you've been listening to this week. What's that? That's not the only music you've been listening to this week, though. Apparently. No, it isn't. Uh, before I get on to that, um, oh. there, was a, there was a couple of folk w- willing, uh, there was a couple of folk wanting us to speak about heavy metal. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, there, was an al- there, was a, there was an album came out this week by a, a heavy psychedelic rock ba- band called The Heads, uh, called Everybody Knows We Got Nowhere. Uh, it sounds like the Stooges MC5, the Spacemen 3. They're, they're a cult band for Bristol. So any of the metalheads that are in, in the comments or listening to us or watching us, uh, have a listen to this. It's probably the heaviest that I get uh, listening to this stuff. Uh, but it's great music if you want to, if you feel like ritualistic killing a hamster or something like that and put it on in the background <laughs> Uh, it's really good. It's heavy psychedelic. If you like, if you like the Stooges, you like MC Five, you like the Heads. So that that's my recommendation of an album for this week. Aye. Now everybody knows that State of Mind is just not a Celtic State of Mind. We're we're, we're our own YouTube channel. We've got other shows. Uh, we've got music shows. And over the last couple of weeks, couple of months even, we've had plenty of State of Mind unplugged sessions. So the day I actually watched the one for the 12th of June, and it was by a band called The Raz, R-A-H-S, for Preston Pans, whose debut album is now out, When Does It Become Real? And it's a great session, an absolutely fantastic session, great interview with the lads. And after watching, I had never heard any of their music before, never, until this acoustic session. And their album's on my playlist for tomorrow when I'm at work uh, to actually listen to their album. The acoustic session's that good. So I would recommend everybody goes to listen to that as well. Uh, on, sa- on Saturday, Friday there, we had Rianne Downey, Downey. Uh, yeah, who, I mean- who was a sensation over the Euros, uh, doing a cover version of Scotland songs, Flower of Scotland and stuff like that. It was uh, Caledonia. 
Cal- Caledonia, she done it. So she she she's been there uh, as well. And who's on this week? Is it Robin Smith? Is it? Robin Smith on this week? We've got the diary booked up. I mean, it's been it's been amazing to be. I mean, please don't think I'm heavily involved. I mean, but I have played like a tiny part <laughs> in helping book the old act. But see, being there watching, I watch Brian Cag, and will be further down the line. Uh, his show go out. You see, being like, just like having the headphones on, watching them play live, make sure the sound levels are all right, and seeing live music again, Kev, for the first time in, oh, I was shudder to think how long, 20 mm-hmm. months, 21 months that I've seen a guy in a, with a microphone strumming a guitar, I mean, let alone a band, but the stuff that's happening in that studio right now is really exciting, and I think, I think it's important that on this old Scream of Celica, we are the, we are the bridge we talk about the football, we talk about memories, and then whilst the state of mind does music stuff, it only feels right that we talk about that, and you're absolutely right, Rian Downey's performance uh, on Saturday is a joke, uh, absolutely outstanding, and comes over really, really well. And there's the other one uh, recommendation I would have, the other one I would have is Brooke Cole. Oh. Been my, that's been my... That, I know the Raz has been maybe one that really caught your eye. Amongst others, by the way, I'm not saying anyone poor, but um, I've got to say, Brooke Cole, unbelievable. If she you're, is, uh, She is going to be massive. Aye, there's just no she two is. ways. There's no two ways. That's star quality thing. I get the same vibe of both the girls that they've both got presence as much as they've got the talent and the skill and the singing ability um, I'm really excited for the acts that are booked ahead as well, I think Saturday night 8pm on A State of Mind could become a very big deal um, because one of these acts so far that have played or one of the ones we've got booked are either already potentially huge or are going to be huge and once you go into the channel as my mate Shawnee Sherman who I've referred to on this many a time he actually messaged me at the weekend and says, I spent all night last night and the first hour of this morning watching every single State of Mind music show. Every one of them he's watched. And he is a music fan, right? That is what he does. And he goes, absolutely brilliant. So definitely, there's a lot of exciting stuff happening. But I, the Raz set is a joke. Brilliant as well. It's good. It's really, really good. Check out their album. I'm going to be checking out their album the more. Daniel Mack comes in and says, the downy one needed to be longer. It easily could have listened to an hour. That, that's that's what we're looking for. We're, we're, we're spreading out. Me and Russell have spoke a few times. If we ever get to do this in the studio, we are going to have a live act in the studio to play us out for to tell us to shut up <laughs> for them for, for, for them for them to play us out. Eh? The first drum you hear, you'll know we've been telling uh, to shut up. <laughs> we've been no, totally to shut man. Up. Um, so. I think that'll do us tonight, Russell. Eh? Uh, I think we've had a good night. It's been a good laugh as usual, Tuesday night madness. Uh, so everybody, just be kind to each other, peace and love, and I'll see you all later. Mm-hmm.